Favored by Fortune by Colleen Kelly Eiding Chapter 1 Had she known as she raced up the mountain path what was to come, perhaps Charlotte would have been better prepared. But then she was only ten years old. Her brother Thomas chased after her, gaining fast. Now neck and neck they ran breathlessly upward until they fell laughing onto a soft patch of grass at the base of the sheer rock face of Raven Crag. Sitting up, they viewed the vast panorama that stretched for miles to the north from Boradale, past the blue of Derwent Water, all the way to Skiddaw's Peak. Charlotte was sure that this was the most beautiful place in the world. Thunder rumbled overhead. Both children took note of the storm clouds gathering over Great Gable to the south. We should go back, Tommy. Remember the boggles, Charlotte warned. Mrs. Mungress told us to be careful. Thomas ignored her pleas, irked that she had called him Tommy again, after he told her that he would only answer to Thomas. He was thirteen, after all, and almost a man. He would do as he wished. He pointed to the dark, jagged entrance of a cave a short distance off. I'm going to explore. He began to pick his way over sharp rocks and soggy earth. The housekeeper would not scare him with her stories of evil spirits inhabiting the fells. Charlotte watched Thomas, admiring his agility and his bravery. She desperately wanted to follow him, but her mother's warnings about caves' dangers and Charlotte's fear of boggles froze her to the spot. She adored her brother, while at the same time he drove her to distraction. He laughed at Mrs. Mungress's stories of spirits, enraging Charlotte because she believed every word. And what about the white stag, Charlotte thought? Her brother had seen it as well as her. It appeared the day that Charlotte and her mother and brother had arrived from Coventry, certain from Mrs. Mungress's letter that their grandfather was dying. They had ridden the pack horses from Keswick all the way to the tiny village of Rosthwaite, then up the hillside to Whitestone, their grandfather's house. Charlotte's grandfather, always a strong and healthy man, now lay in bed looking like a skeleton. Mrs. Mungress had shooed the children outside, advising them to stay out of the stinker plant unless they wanted to smell like dead rabbits. Well, as they climbed to the ridge above the house and looked down on the villages of Rosthwaite to the west and Watentleth to the east, Charlotte suddenly saw the white stag. A more beautiful creature could not exist, of that she was sure. Its antlers were made of pearl that glistened in the sun. Thomas moved, and the stag bolted across the fell side. The children gave pursuit, but it disappeared as if by magic. When Charlotte and Thomas returned to their grandfather's house, they found a miracle had occurred. Their grandfather had opened his eyes and smiled. As the rejoicing died down, Charlotte told the adults of the stag's appearance. Mrs. Mungress clapped her hands, saying, "'Ha, ah, t'was a sign, child. Your white stag, you see. A change in fortune, I was a-telling you.' And now, only a fortnight later, they were on an outing with their mother and grandfather. It would have been sooner, but rain had fallen in sheets for two weeks. Being confined to the house was difficult for the high-spirited children, and Charlotte's mother, Dorothy Bird, had on more than one occasion chastised her daughter for being an Amazon. As Charlotte attempted to tiptoe by her mother while preparations were being made for the day's outing, she overheard Mrs. Mungress warn Dorothy of a new sign— such a howling there was last night. You must have heard it, Mistress Dorothy. It was only the wind. What is troubling you, dear Mrs. Mungress? I didn't think it was the wind, Mistress Dorothy. What else could it have been? I hate to say the word. Please tell me. The barkest, Mrs. Mungress whispered. Mrs. Mungress. I will not entertain such an idea. No one is in harm's way. Papa is recovering. The children are healthy. Please, you are alarming yourself unnecessarily. That was the stag, and now this. They are signs. You cannot deny that your father came back to us after the white heart appeared. I know what I heard. It was not the wind. 
Charlotte's grandfather, being impatient to get it away, called for his daughter to come outside and join them in the farm cart. Dorothy patted Mrs. Muncress's hand, called for Charlotte to follow, and they left for the picnic on the fells. A flash of light to the right of her brother jolted Charlotte's thoughts into the present. It was the white stag. Tommy, she called out. Her brother glared at her over his shoulder. She pointed, jumping up and down. He saw it, but the stag, startled by her movements, dashed up the path. Thomas scrambled over the rocks, pursuing the deer. Charlotte, forgetting her fears, followed on her brother's heels. Below, the children's mother and grandfather, just finishing their meal, heard Charlotte's shouts. Hurrying up the path, they saw the children running after the stag. Fearful for her children's safety, Dorothea Bird attempted to call them back, but they did not hear her over the thunder rumbling loudly above the peaks. The clouds that had gathered over the mountains now burst open, spilling torrents of water down with such speed that the stone kettles at Glaramara summit overflowed in a matter of minutes. A wave surged forward, channeled between the high banks of the two narrow becks that fed Hind Gill. The white stag, attempting to jump the spot where the two becks joined, missed its mark in the rain and slid down the steep, muddy bank. The animal barely had time to see the wall of water surging toward it. Engulfed, its thin legs flailing, lungs filling with water, the stag struggled to right itself. Thomas, seeing the deer's plight, ran to a fallen tree that crossed Hind Gill. Perhaps he thought to stop the animal's progress— but he had not figured on the weight of the stag nor the force of the water. When the flood hit the place where he kneeled, the tree snapped in two, and Thomas went under. He came up, entangled with the stag, whose thrashing hooves sliced his face. Charlotte screamed for her brother as she rushed along the bank next to him. Raindrops hit her face with such stinging force she felt they must be needles. Horrified, she watched as the stag and Thomas were swept over the edge of the cliff as the water hurtled down to Seathwaite below. By some miracle, the stag's antlers caught in a tangle of roots and stones at the top of the cataract, and there Charlotte saw her brother desperately clinging to the deer's body. She crawled out onto a narrow rock ledge, telling herself all the while not to look down. There she lay flat and stretched out her hands until she touched her brother's arms— "'Can you grasp hold?' she cried to him over the water's roar. He turned his face slightly toward the sound of her voice. Blood ran freely from the corner of his eye down to his throat. She saw him nod. This made her bold, and she inched out a little further while wrapping her feet around the edges of the rock. He grabbed for her hands, and moving as quickly as his cold limbs would allow, he found a toehold. Then fortune turned its face, and the stag's body broke free. Charlotte fought with all her strength to hold on to Thomas, but the stag's antlers caught hold of his sodden clothes and tore him away. A terrible scream escaped Charlotte's lips as she watched him fall. The deer hit the rocks a split second before Thomas. The pearl antlers caught him, piercing his neck and shoulders. The torrent of water carried them downstream as one body. Charlotte lay sobbing on the little spit of rock. She felt a hand touch her back and looked up to see her grandfather's ashen face. I tried to save him, Grandpapa. She looked to her mother, who stood staring at the rapids below. Mama, Mama, she implored, her voice so small in the storm that raged around them.